good to see everybody. I, uh, I'm not sure where everybody's from, my, uh, but uh, it's uh, like Virginia is like, I mean, it's September, but it's still summer in, in Virginia. It's summer in September, but it's like close to 100 Northern Virginia today. So it was hot. And even here down in the mountains, um, it was uh, still pretty warm. So, but uh, so good to see everyone uh, tonight. And um, I think of all the lectures that we've done, this uh, that we're going to look at tonight with B.B. Warfield is like a bridge between the, what I'm going to call the radical historical uh, theologians that came out of Germany or were uh, motivated by German theology and Protestant evangelicalism and even fundamentalism here in the United States. And and before we look at this, I, I want to give credit where credit is due. And I, I don't, we're going to look at it in a slide. But uh, Dr. Ted Ledis, who's not with us, uh, taken to heaven early, did a great uh, article on this. It's it's succinct. It's, uh, it's easy to read. Uh, but he, he captures the whole spirit of this. And... Uh, when Ted was in, uh, Dr. Leaders was in Europe, that's when I was in Westminster, and uh, we communicated back and forth, but um, he was a tremendous help to me on this, all right? So I just want to make sure that uh, that everybody knows that. If, if you can find Dr. Ted Leaders' work on the role of B.B. Warfield, I'm going to cite some of it. But uh, he's done just tremendous work, research on this, and I'm accessing uh, some of his work. So we want to again welcome everybody and uh, we'll open with a word of prayer and we'll look into the material tonight. Thank you, Father, for the blessing of the day and even for the warmth, Father. We thank thee and uh, thank you, Father, that you are a good and gracious God and that you care for us. Uh, your eye is on the sparrow, your eye is on every saint. And uh, I ask, Father, tonight for those who are grieving uh, that may be suffering the loss of a loved one, that you just bear them up and strengthen them and give them all they stand in need of. We know, Father, that thou art the God of all comfort and at difficult times, Father, and really at all times, but at really at difficult times, we know that you are there to aid us and help us and get through those times. So thank you for the, the brothers and sisters as they've gathered. Just give us a great time as we consider this material. We'll give thee the praise and the thanksgiving. For all the has done. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll get started here. So this is uh, Warfield, 1887 to uh, 1921. And uh, I didn't get into a lot of detail here uh, in these slides, but um, Warfield was just considered like a rising star, one of the young men that was going to do great things in evangelicalism. Uh, the Hodge, the Hodge brothers, or the Hodges at Princeton, saw this uh, the, his acumen, and uh, yeah, Alexander and Charles Hodge, and uh, so um, being this up and coming star, so to speak, as far as scholarship goes, uh, he was sent over to uh, study with the German rationalists. All right, and. Um, I guess when you start, you want to be like on the cream of the crop or the leading edge of theological discourse. You want to study with what you would say was the best and the brightest. And they had some tremendous scholars there, of course. But I, I'm of the opinion, however, and that's the argument I'm making here in reference to providence, that if you're anchored in your faith and if you're settled in what the word of God says, uh, you can go anywhere to school. And you can get the best out of what there is to offer, and you're able to sift out the material that you know doesn't work. I know what I just said there. Sometimes when I would talk to young people that were planning to go to school, parents didn't appreciate me saying that because they wanted a place that was safe, where all they were going to hear would be a rehearsal of what happened around the uh, the table at, at home, you know, at the dinner table for devotions or whatever their pastor said. But I just I just believe, and you have to be anchored in it. Then if you are, you can go anywhere and get the best of it. You can get a degree from a top flight sort of school. You might not agree with everything that's said there, 
but you can still study with men that uh, really have a lot on the ball. So can't hardly fault him for this. It's just what happens there is rather than maintaining his orthodox roots, he actually embraces the argument that they're making there and makes it his own and brings it back across the ocean to the United States. That's the problem, okay, with Warfield, because he's a brilliant man and he's a product of his time. He's here at the end of uh, the 19th century. But uh, what he does uh, in his genius and in his skills, his skill sets the Lord had given him, and in his training is create an entire paradigm shift in evangelical theology. He shifts it all over. And he, what happened with uh, Warfield and then those that followed in Warfield's footsteps are still with us today. And unfortunately, even our evangelical and I'll say even fundamental schools, colleges and seminaries have fallen in line with the old this Princeton idea that was established with Warfield. And I think among fundamentalists, the fundamentalists have always had this sense of insecurity, in my opinion. That is, they're, they don't want to look uh, at, at academics like they're like these uh, guys that are behind the curve. So they want to be on the leading edge of things so they can deal with things on that level. Uh, and all I'm saying is I think you can deal with the lead. You can be on the leading edge of everything and still be orthodox, only explain what the leading edge is about and show how it lines up with Scripture or doesn't line up with Scripture. I think you would end up with just a, a fantastic education if you did that. You don't have to buy, you know, lock, stock, and barrel everything, every new thing, like the Athenians, they just came to hear something new. You just don't have to buy it. So this is this is Warfield. He says, leading up to the national implications of replacing scripture with history in Germany, because that had already happened over there, all right? Rather than it being an inspired text, they're dealing with it as a historical document. This is the historical critical approach, and it is anchored there now in Germany, all right? This whole idea of what we're doing with the Protestant Reformation, they, uh, this is this is a bygone idea. We're at the end of the Enlightenment, and uh, so they're just looking at the Bible or the the text of Scripture like any other book. All right, they're, this is the search for the historical Jesus stuff. It's coming out of Germany. So there was a it was the wide ranging impact of this theolo theological transition in the lectures of Benjamin Breck Breckenridge Warfield professor of theology at Princeton. I mean, remember in 1929, and this is going to be after Warfield, but 1929, because Princeton had departed so far from the faith that Machen and those of his era separated from Princeton and established Westminster Seminary. I mean, back in those days, because this stuff had so uh, infected Princeton that you weren't going to get what you call a historic Protestant Orthodox uh, theological training there any longer, and we're all the way back just in the beginning of the of the 1900s, beginning of the 20th century. So perhaps the most impactful miscarriages, and I and I say these words, uh, it's these are strong words, but when you see what it's done, uh, these words are worthy of the event. Perhaps the most impactful miscarriages of the application of providence were the redefinition of the 1647 Westminster Confession of Faith, Chapter 1, Section 8. This is this is gigantic, beloved. For those that are here tonight and those that will watch this later, what we're looking at here is going to be a redefinition, a, a refocusing of the Westminster Confession. And by doing that, uh, theologians of that time could say this, and this is this is just a kind of a Weasley way to do things, but this is how things happen. They could say that they could sign on and agree with the Westminster Confession and thus uh, teach signing the convention in a pro in a Presbyterian seminary while in their minds rendering it completely differently than their predecessors had. That's what's happening. This is a. Uh, you just have to keep this in mind because you say to yourself, well, how can they sign these documents that have such deep historic meaning when what they what they actually mean has deep historical and theological roots? Knowing full well 
that they don't actually believe that in the moment, but they have the liberty of conscience, so to speak. And I, I, I can't see their conscience, but the idea that they can sign it and say, I believe in what the Westminster Confession teaches. It is because the, the interpretation of the Westminster Confession has been modified to meet a post-enlightenment crit critical uh, understanding. And Warfield is the seminal, he is the first to do this in his Oxford lectures. And once that was done, that one event opened the floodgates of interpreting the confession in a way that it had never, ever prior been interpreted. So now you can, they're going to be able to argue that they believe in the historical critical approach and still say, I'm still a good Presbyterian because I can sign the confession teach at the seminary. All right. Um, anyway, so that's where this is going. So in the Westminster Confession, and we've gone through this for those that have been with us, Dr. Van Cleek Jr. and I, we've been through this a zillion times. You probably have all this. You probably had it memorized before you ever even got here. <laughs> right. Um, it's not just the Westminster Confession. It's just this is just and it was adopted by the Baptists as well. These same words uh, in the second London. But it says this, when it says, and by his singular care and providence kept pure in all ages are therefore authentical. What we've been doing is we have been rendering that, that phrase that was under the tutelage of Lee and the Westminster divines, quoted, who quoted Whitaker more often than anybody else, who was a direct uh, uh, connection with Calvin, this deep theological significance of these words. It's not just the Westminster Confession but it's really a reflection of the way that scripture was understood all the way through the, uh, the Reformation and before. And by a singular care and providence kept pure in all ages are therefore authentical. So this is, this is going to be the target. This is the bullseye now that Warfield has to deal with because if that is true according to its historic Orthodox rendering, then everything he's doing in Germany and bringing back uh, is not orthodox. So there's got to be a modification here. So having returned from Germany, being immersed in the historical critical method, and I am not giving him, I'm not giving him an, a way out on this. I think, matter of fact, if, if I had the intellect of Warfield, I think to go to Germany and study with these guys would have been an amazing thing um, to, to just see what was going on. Just because you're studying with these guys, let me say again, does not mean you have to embrace it. You do not have to embrace it. That's why I think you can go anywhere to school, get a good education, as long as you allow the Bible to be your guide. If they teach you anything that's inconsistent with the exegesis of Scripture, you check it out. And if it, if it aligns itself with Scripture, then you embrace it. Having returned from Germany, being immersed in the historical critical method, which he also accepted wholeheartedly, Warfield's Oxford lectures forever changed, forever changed. We're living with it today. The theological tra tra trajectory of the American Academy and subsequently the church. It's upon us today. Uh, and then I said, if ever such egregious words were penned, and which leads me to the next slide. But what you'll, perhaps the pastor in the pew who take, takes this critical approach or perhaps the professor in his office and then as he lectures his students in college and seminary, perhaps he's not directly acquainted with this connection, but all he's doing, all he, he's doing, whether he understands what he's doing or not, is aligning himself with this paradigm shift, a true, not, not to use it, the word, you know, obtusely. A true paradigm shift in how you render the confession and how you understand singular care and providence. That's all they're doing. They can, might say they agree with the confession, but they're not rendering the confession uh, according to its historical interpretation. So if ever such egregious words were penned, and this is the quote, and, and uh, you're going to want to get this book if you ever go to war with somebody. And I say go to war because it, this could get really sticky because Warfield... Every, you know, inspiration and authority of scripture and all the other things that he's written. Uh, he's held in such high esteem. And uh, it, the thing I don't, the thing that bothers me about this too is, is like if I talk to another pastor or professor, you know, they begin to, 
they begin to, you know, compare brain cells, you know, like, well, Warfield's Warfield and you're not. <laughs> well, that's true. There's only one Warfield and he was brilliant. But brilliant men can be wrong all the time. All right. That's the point. You, you, you just can't fold on that. Uh, you just you just hold your ground. But this is what Warfield wrote. Before we look at it, this is the book you have to get. You get Benjamin Warfield, the Westminster Assembly and its work. It's uh, at Baker's. Uh, it was published in 1991, page 239. That if you don't have that, you need to get that. You need to just go to that page, highlight it, you know, dog ear it, and and use this as often as you need to to show how this whole switch, this idea of providence, was changed. So this is what he writes. This is this is this is the seminal statement in his West in his Westminster uh, or excuse me the Oxford Lectures. He says this in a quote, in the sense of the Westminster Confession, therefore, the multiplicity of copies of the scriptures. Nobody's arguing that there's not the multiplicity of copies of scriptures. Turretin talks about it all the time. The several early efforts towards the revision of the text. And that is, when he talks about revision here, I'm not exactly sure what he's dealing with. But he goes on here, the raising up of scholars in our own day. Now, we know what that is. Because in 1881, that's the West Scott and Horse. These are the guys he's going to cite. The rising up of scholars in our own day to collect and collate manuscripts. Collect and collate manuscripts. He speaks like the received text does not exist. There is already a standard sacred text already present. It's called the Texas Receptus, and there is already an English version that the church has held to since 1611, which is called the King James Bible. And I would say, before we get the rest of this, all of that is here by the providence of God, the TR and the, uh, the King James Bible. He's sliding all that aside, and he's starting over again when he says, about the rising, raising up of scholars in our own day to collect and collate manuscripts. This is according to new textual critical ideas and principles that the oldest is best, the shortest is best, the hardest to read is best, and the passage from which other texts would be copied is best. That the TR is full of conflations, it's full of duplications, it's longer because it's been, it's been uh, uh, engrandized, all right? That the last uh, nine verses of Mark aren't there. The paracope de adultery is not there. First John uh, 5.17 is not there. Uh, Acts 8.37 is not there. Um, this this is the, what he's dealing with. That's that's all this is. He's, he's now reinforcing this from a high point of academic scholarship at Princeton Seminary, which is held in high esteem in America and Europe. And now he's asserting this as the way it is, as he, he's going to redefine the Westminster Confession. He says, he says, to reform the text on scientific principles, not based on anything we're talking about here. He's talking about the way they do it in Germany. And these are the men that he cites, Artischendorfs and Tregelises and Westcott and Hortz. He's citing these men that did not hold to the TR. He's citing these men that did not believe in providential preservation. He's citing these men that did not believe in the historic interpretation or, or rendering of the Westminster Confession, and thus is rejecting the whole Reformation trajectory of how we understand the scripture. And he's starting over again from a modern perspective. He cites these men, none of which believe that the text is inspired. Then he says this, and that's why I highlighted it. And all, are all all these men that deny the TR and the scripture that the church, the ecclesiastical text, the standard sacred text, the sacred text of the believing community, all of these men are part of God's singular care and providence. He asserts them there. It even that it's a, the reason it's egregious is because singular care and providence does not mean a secondary source. When they said singular care and providence, they meant a singular care, God's singular care. And God's providence, not through a secondary means. So he adds that as well here, because he's saying all of these men were like handmaidens to God. He doesn't say that, but that's the idea. 
to make sure that God's word stays pure. They are all part of God's singular care and providence in preserving his inspired word pure. And that last part is so gratuitous. I mean, it, it almost, it's pathetic because none of these men believed it was preserved and none of them believed it was inspired. None of them believed that it's pure. But this that's why it's the bridge. On one side, he's got men that deny all these fundamental truths of scripture inspired pure preserved they reject all that and at the same time he's linking them in the confession as if what they're doing is they're in the process of preserving god's inspired word pure except if you use those last words his inspired word pure even now if you try to use those words in a seminary or in a church where they're using a critical text nobody believes this but because of his stature uh it it took on it, it it became a grounding principle so and uh then uh, this is the quote uh and if you don't have this you need to try to find one for an excellent chronology of the 19th century check upon the save the standard or received text and the 1647 westminster confession of faith see dr theodore p Leidis. and this is it it is bb warfield common sense philosophy and biblical criticism you need to get that. It's it's not very big. It's just a, it's paper. It was in American Presbyterians, volume 69, number three in fall of 91. He he did such a yeoman's job on this, Dr. Lee. Just, Ted did just a, just a great job on this. All right. And if you get that, it's not much to read. I don't think it's more than maybe 20 or 30 pages. It's just like a paper. But he got it published. And it's very well done. And it succinctly hits all the high points about how we went from uh, the higher critical approach in Germany, how Warfield modifies the confession to make it say what it never meant to say, and how that impacted American evangelicalism. But that is the quote. He's saying that singular care and providence is now done by men that deny the inspiration of the Bible. So I, the, my next slide here is the misuse of providence. And then I'll give you some quotes here just to to validate what I'm saying about these men, they didn't believe this. So the misuse of providence in 34 Germany, in 1934 Germany, providence was the grounds for embracing Hitler. We already went through that. For Warfield and Princeton, we might not say it's the same gravity, but even then, when you start missing, uh, when you start compromising the word of God, the the ramifications of what he did because it is the word of God, and it is the means of salvation, and it is the source of our knowledge of God, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It, it's like, and I've said this, it's like, and I don't, I don't mind if this is going out over YouTube at all. It's like we might have defeated Germany in the war with the, with the power of the U.S. Army and the Marines, all right? Well, the Marines were in the Pacific, but mostly the U.S. Army. We did, but... Germany, in the end, wins the day by breaking down the church and breaking down the home and breaking down our institutions of higher learning, our theological institutions, by this infection of the this higher critical approach, which was introduced onto our shores. If you want to look at the beachhead, so to speak, for the, the ultimate victory that Germany is going to have on the United States, it was Warfield, this great Presbyterian scholar that was that led the charge. Except when he went ashore, everybody just cheered him on because of who he was. Yeah, they just they just opened their doors. It becomes part of what goes on in Princeton. Princeton turned out professors. Those professors went all through the United States. And as those professors began presidents and deans of institutions, that became entrenched in our our theological system here in America. So a providence was the grounds for the transfer. It is a transfer of God's singular care and providence, uh, the preservation of scripture to the providence. And here it is, the providence of historical reconstruction. Because the text is just a historic document and, quote, to reform the text on scientific principles, which is what I cited. Uh, these principles, and, I, and we call it, the, he says principles, but they are far less principles than it is a method. And then you have to ask yourself, 
where did who generated this method? Is it ex an exegetically based method? Is it even theologically based method? Or is it a me method that is external to the text that is being foisted, a template that's being placed over the text? And I say that's exactly what it is. The method was an external means of interpreting the Bible. That is, it was humanly generated by these men in such a way that if you followed their method, there's no way what they produced would be the same or could align itself with the standard sacred texts of the church, which had been the TR for years. So, indeed, the work of critical scholars is providential. We've already said that because everything is providential. God's responsible for the good and the bad. When when bad things happen, when Warfield got back to the States, he didn't say, oh, oh no, Warfield's there. What am I going to do? No, when he comes back, there's Warfield, and this is all part of God's providence. But we argued that providence oftentimes, many times, is there for us to reject based on our exegesis understanding of the Bible. Providence can never take precedence over our understanding of the scriptures. This is the this is the, the disaster of the American church. So he comes back and we say, yeah, it was providential that he came back and look at all the great stuff he learned. I would have I would have enjoyed studying under Warfield, but that doesn't mean when I got out of there I'm giving up the sacred text of the church. But people did. They rolled over. And they're still rolling over. And that is the question we all have every Tuesday night when we say, why did they do that? Why didn't they just compare what Warfield brought over with the text that they have in their hand upon which the nation was founded, the church was grounded, that homes were established, that marriages were preserved, that children were trained, that uh, institutions of higher lit, uh, uh, learning were founded? How is it now that this began, began to be the grounding principle? that Hort argued for an errant autograph. And I'm going to show you the slide here. Hort argued that not even the original was without error. That is, he never believed the scriptures, even when we argue that the Holy Spirit was the creative agent and therefore it was infallible. He never believed that. Nobody did after the Enlightenment. I mean, I'm only giving you this quote, but nobody believes that. Only you... Only the crazy Orthodox people like me and others, who, I mean, we weren't alive back then, but we're still saying that the, the what the uh, our Reformation era forefathers generated was true. And that's all Dr. Van Cleek Jr. and I are saying right now. What they generated is orthodoxy, and what these guys inserted is not. Matter of fact, it's not just not orthodoxy. It is an attack on orthodoxy. And here we are. That Hort argued for an Aaron autograph. The original, it was never without error, but was providential in the sense of providing the believing academy and church an opportunity to grow stronger by standing against the error. And there you go for all those that are watching. So it, 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 here comes an idea. How many ideas do we hear about every day? All these ideas, some are theological, some are political, some are, you know, ecclesiastical, personal, moral, you know, ethical, right, cultural. I mean, whatever category you want to put it in. How do we determine whether or not what we're hearing and seeing is right or not? Do we take the word of the scholar who is telling us that this is the new way? Or do we weigh everything against sound exegesis and say, that guy's right because it's consistent here. And that guy, he's off, the, he's off his rocker. Isn't that what we do? We do it all the time. And that's what this should have done. The church should have just said, man, they should never send Warfield over there because he came back off his rocker. I mean, look what he's trying to do to the church. That's not what happened. And, uh, and it's almost like when you see it in hindsight, it's almost like God said, I'm going to let it stay here long enough just to see how many churches and people in the church are going to buy this. And here we are. It goes on. The scholars critical of the Texas Receptus were allowed to produce their writings as part of God's sovereign plan was providential. <laughs> Nobody's saying it's not. But such turn of events arose so uh, uh, to erudite and gifted minds like Warfield, no, excuse me, so erudite and gifted minds like Warfield could reject their errors based on the promise of God, God's word and prevent German heterodoxy from becoming what it is now in academia, the prominent influence on the formulation of Holy Scripture. And that would have been the that would have been the, the best case scenario that, uh, yep, 
Warfield went over there and he heard all that stuff. And because he was a genius, just a great mind, he would have said, boy, you would not, the stuff that's going on over there, that is not going to help us here in the States. And, and, and like, uh, I, I was thinking of uh, John William Bergan, brilliant man. I mean, he knew, you know, everything about, I mean, especially the patristics. Uh, all he would do is he would just take, he knew the arguments bo all, on both sides. And it's not that he ever shunned the arguments on the other side. It's just he knew them so well that he knew how to address them. And Warfield could have done the same thing. But that is not what happened. So German heterodoxy is now the prominent influence here in the United States. And here's here's uh, one of my West Cotton Hart quotes, which I've had for years. It's just too straightforward. This is what Hort writes. And uh, you, it's uh, we have the New Testament, the original Greek, volume two. Uh, page 277, and I believe this quote right here, the first quote is this one uh, about the uh, introduction of the New Testament, the original Greek, page 208. But this is what he writes. And I used to keep this on the shelf when people would come over to visit, you know, and, and not familiar with this material, talk about the higher critical method and how it's really not that much different than what we believe now. It's just a, it's just a shade of difference. It's not really significantly different. But this is what Hort writes. He says, little is gained by speculating as to the precise point at which such corruptions came in, because they're already assuming that it's not providentially preserved, even though Warfield's trying to, you know, squeeze it into the confession. No, nobody believes this. They may have been due, here you go, to the original writer, Paul. See, it wasn't inspired. Paul wrote something that was wrong. Peter, Moses, Daniel. David, all the original writers. The error might have been not, I mean, they're not they're not considering inspiration as we consider inspiration at all. It might have been due to the original writer, and that's the point. Or, or his amanuensis. If he wrote from dictation, that is, if Paul was actually quoting to someone and they wrote it down, then they just didn't get it right. And they made a mistake because they misheard Paul. You know, there was a, a, a there was a dog barking outside, and instead of writing that word, they wrote another word. But it was just an easy mistake. But uh, the original was the, the original was not without error, or it may have been due to one of the earliest transcribers. That says when they started to copy it, then it was lost in translation. It just lost in the copy. So Hort considered scripture no more than other humanly originated writings, and that's what you have to remember. That is the guy that that Warfield says God's using uh, to keep his word uh, prov uh, pure by singular care and providence. As a guy that doesn't believe in singular care and providence and believes the original is corrupt. The, the, uh, the autographer from the pen of Moses is corrupt. And then Hort considers scripture no more than other humanly originated writings. And then he says this, for ourselves, we near not induce considerations which could not reasonably be applied to other ancient texts. We can't, we can't speak of the scriptures any differently than anything else because it's all a historical, critical method. They're all just a product of history. This one is just in a theological vein. This over here is something of a patristic vein. This has to do with other disciplines of the past. It's, these are all just documents that, that suffered the same ramifications of being historic documents. So he says, for ourselves, we dare not induce considerations which could not reasonably be applied to any other ancient text. Listen, if we're going to look at this, this is the way we're going to look at everything else. Supposing them to have documentary attestation of equal amount, variety, and antiquity. He's just saying they're not really in every way, if they're, uh, if they're, uh, if they're as old as everything else, they have variety like everything else. Documentary attestation, that is, there's other documents that attest to it. I mean, it's just like everything else, but that's what they believed about it. And these are the guys that uh, Warfield uh, is raising to the level of the ones that are responsible for preserving the word uh, by God's singular care and prophets and kept pure in all ages and are therefore authentical. So here's the observations. And um, I, I pinned this a long time ago. I'm, I put the whole quote up here because I want you to see the the political and societal and academic ramifications of what we're up against. And um, so he, here it is. Warfield's secular definition of divine providence should come as no surprise considering the time in which he lived. 
this should not be a surprise because, as I said, we got to be careful because we're all just a product of the world in which we live in. If you don't let the Bible govern your life, then you will just you will be like the world around you during the time you live. So I was born in 56. And so I lived through the 60s, the 70s, right, the 80s, the 90s. We'll see how long we're around. But that is the epoch of time the Lord has given me. And you can just put yourself in there. I did not live during my grandfather's time or my great grandfather's time or my dad's time. They lived and dealt with other things. This is the time. If you do not allow the scriptures to govern your life, then it will be the world in which you live in, which will really guide and direct who you are. I mean, the way you consider things. So the Enlightenment axiom. And you need to remember this homo mansura. I think you've heard that from me or Dr. Van Cleek Jr. Homo mansura. It's the Latin. It means man is the measure. Man is the measure. The Enlightenment axiom, homo mansura, created a cultural milieu that bred the philosophies. During this time of Charles Darwin, see the dates? Charles Darwin, 1809 to 1882. And the elimination of God in the biological disciplines of in the origin of the species which he wrote in 1859 so now we're talking about biology biology now is considered atheistically we have one we have like the granddaddy granddaddy of what we're dealing with now when it comes to different forms of evolution let's press on you got karl marx lives at the same time 1818 to 1883 and the relegation of sin there's no more sin all you have is failed social and political systems beginning with a thesis on Feuerbach in 1845 and moving to the critique of political economics in 1859 and finally Das Kapital in 1867. So we're just a product of our societal problems and we're the, the poor people are being oppressed and the rich people are the oppressors and we have the the uh, bottom, we have the like the groundwork for what we call uh, communism, all right, socialism and communism. That's That's going on right now. You have Sigmund Freud, 1856 to 1939, anti-Christian impact in the field of psychology. It should therefore, and in, 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 in Freud, I mean, again, we're not talking about body, soul, and spirit. I mean, he is redefining who we are. We're not in the image of God, all right, when Freud begins to deal with all this. But on every level, culturally, uh, um, in, uh, philosophically, economically, they are immersed in a time of, of atheism as it is just being pressed upon the culture. Uh, and, uh, and it's in the midst of that then that we say it should therefore also be no surprise that the introduction to the New Testament in the original Greek written in 1882 by the Anglican scholars Brooke Foss Westcott and John uh, Fenton, John Anthony Hort, who are contemporary with the previously cited scholars, should not have escaped the mid to late 19th century secular omission of God from that era's textual criticism, and is totally void of any reference to God's providential preservation of the text from either an exegetical or historic standpoint. They were living in an epoch of time where this was the current thinking. It is this post-enlightenment idea uh, where man is the measure, He's going to reinterpret who man is, like Freud. He's going to interpret what economics are, like uh, like Marx. He's going to establish where our origin is. There's no such thing as six-day creation because we now have Charles Darwin. And, and in the mix of that, we're also going to redefine what the scriptures are with Westcott and Hort because this is the milieu, the cultural milieu, the, the spirit of the age. Uh, the zeitgeist, is one of my profs would say. It's the spirit of the age. And so this is all just falling together at the same time. And so when I say it should come as no surprise, considering that this is happening, we should sit back and say, if there's anything coming out of that time, we need to critically, critically evaluate it in light of what we understand about what the Bible says and what orthodoxy is. Because what comes out of here is, is whole lock, stock, and barrel atheistic. It's man is the measure. So um, uh, history alone govern the scriptures is what they're going to argue. And Warfield, amal Warfield's amalgamation of this confession with an autonomous view of history was what was uh, that was neither Christian nor secular uh, to the satisfaction of sh short sighted Protestant and, and evangelical scholars. Because 
it wasn't either higher critical because he's still quoting the confession and it wasn't the confession because he's got he's given his credit to all these high, higher critics but for some reason and i think it was just the reputation of warfield uh it found grounds in our culture so here's the question returning then to the question in allowing the historical critical method to thrive how ought we to interpret the providence of god it's here and i'm already arguing it's providential is this something the scripturally informed believers should embrace or is it something god has allowed for the academy and church to grow stronger by the rejection of the historical critical method and i'm saying the latter the church would have grown so i mean it would have grown stronger if they would have said no we're not going that way that's not true and they would have preached messages against it and said that the direction of princeton uh, is going in the wrong direction this is not the way it works we're not doing this this is what providence does when we compare it to the exegesis of scripture and we use the scriptures to determine whether providence is good for us or bad for us so this quote, Abram Kuyper, 1837 to 1920, this is another one. You, if you can get your hands on this book, you need to get this. You need to dog ear the pages. This is Kuyper and Principles of Sacred Theology. Uh, the edition I had was 1954. Uh, it was first written in 1898 and uh, page 347 and 348. When I, I, first time I cited this was at Calvin Seminary. And when I cited this, it was in a, an argument similar to what we're lecturing here. My professors came after me like tooth and nail because they they did not. I don't think they really knew it was in there. Now I'm citing it favorably to argue for uh, a, a pre-critical Reformation position on Scripture because Warf or K uh, Kuiper here is calling out what uh, Warfield and what these critics are doing. And. And if you're going to take that stand, you want all the heavy hitters to all be on the same page. But Kuiper's not. And uh, and I was able, so to speak, to win the day. I didn't take it out of my paper because they could not they could not uh, find enough ammo to discredit the quote. So I put it up here, having already tested this in an academic setting. All right. Some people won't like this, but if you see it within a time frame that it's written, I, I think it's it's absolutely credible and applicable. So this is Abram Kuyper in 1837 and 1920. Wonderful words he writes, because this is us. Now, we don't agree everything with Kuyper, of course, but great, great observation here. He says, it is unfortunate, however, that in, that in the olden time, so little attention was paid to the formal principium. The formal principium is the scriptures. We quit paying attention to the Bible. For now it seemed altogether as though the still darkened understanding, the darkened understanding, this is the first Corinthians 2 material where it talks about the natural man. I mean, I didn't include the references here, but this is an understanding that is not in tune with the spirit and word. This is what he's in reference to. He calls it the darkened understanding, not an enlightened understanding, not a wise understanding, not an understanding that's governed by the, the spirit and word. He says, for now it seemed altogether as though the still darkened understanding was to investigate scripture as its object. So you have a darkened understanding, which is also already in rebellious rebellion against God, all right? Because it's the natural man who receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, uh, neither can he know them for they're sp uh, spiritually discerned or their foolishness unto him, excuse me. That, that mind is now going to investigate scripture. Well, there's only one way that that, the, the, at the end of that, there's only one thing that's going to happen with that mind investigate scripture. And that is the mind, this darkened understanding is going to take precedence because that's the nature of a, the natural man. He says, he says the still darkened understanding was to investigate scripture as its object, like it's a thing over here. In an entirely similar way uh, to which uh, this same understanding threw itself on plant and animal as its subject. That is talking about um, um, Darwin, right? And especially Darwin, but he's talking about where plant life comes from, animal life comes, right? It, it not have anything in reference to do with the scriptures. At first, this compelled the understanding to adapt and accommodate itself to the authority of holy scriptures. At first, the scriptures were, was, were winning the day, which then maintained a high position. When the scriptures were held a high position, position then the scriptures won the day and you have a proper rendering of it but in the long run which is where we are now many years after this in the long run 
the roles were to be exchanged and the neglect of the formal principium, which is simply to say the neglect of the scripture uh, as it has now, excuse me, in the sense of our darkened understand, excuse me, I, I, the neglect of the formal principium was to bring about a revision of the scripture in the sense of our darkened understanding as has now actually taken place. And it was that line they wanted, they wanted me to take out. So he's writing uh, this in 1898, and he's saying that we just had a change where the darkened understanding is now brought about a revision of the scripture, and it's here with us now. That's what the guys, that's what the guys at Calvin wanted me to take out. All right. For if faith was considered under soteriology, which it is, all right, soteriology or, or the doctrine of salvation. And connection with faith, the illumination. What help was this? Listen, what good is all of this as long as theology, what, what Dr. Van Cleek and I are discussing, what we hold to, as long as theology itself is abandoned to the rational subject. If I am going to determine what theology is, and I'm not going to allow the scripture, the form of Principium, to impel me to believe what it says, that the Holy Spirit is the one teaching me. Now the scriptures are under my control to make it say whatever I want because the theology has been abandoned to the rational subject, to the thing, to the person. In which rational subject, now he's talking about men, from the hour of his creation, no proper and separate principium or special principle of knowing God has been, allow has been allowed to assert itself because man is fundamentally rebellious. So rebellious man is now the rational subject. I mean, he is now uh, in control and treats the Bible as its object. And you come up with what he says here is a revision of scripture in the sense of our darkened understanding, which is, uh, as has now actually taken place. So, so we look at the times here. We go out here and let me go here. Let's see. Uh, Oh, I thought I put it in. Oh, no. Hang on. I'm running out of time. I need to show you that. Um, is this the one? Let's see. Oh, where is that? I Because I, I, I had the... Um, that's Lee... All right, here. I just skip ahead. Um, yeah, here it is. Written in 1898. Yeah, this is the one. Written in 1898, the revision of scripture that has now actually taken place and hit in what Kuiper writes is unspecified. A fair assumption, however, is that Kuiper is referring to the Westcott and Hort Greek New Testament published in 1881 that preceded Nestle's first edition Greek New Testament published a year later in 1899. It's, it's in the same framework. Kuiper strikes at the transcendentless crux of the historical critical method. At first studying scripture like any every other discipline with a darkened understanding accommodated, accommodated itself to scripture, but in time the authority of scripture, the formal principium was exchanged for a revision of the scripture in the sense of our darkened understanding or our natural understanding. So we took the the formal principium, principium which was a scripture and we re replaced it now with this document uh, which was a revision of scripture in the sense of our darkened understanding or natural understanding Kuiper asks what good is this development as long as the study of God is abandoned to men yeah we ask that all the time if this man is going to generate who God is um, Ludwig Feuerbach uh, if you look at State or Sacred Test and look up Feuerbach uh, I mean uh, just another I mean I mean, what he wrote was crazy, but uh, I love him because what he said is, is um, God is just a projection of, of men. It's just something we project, all right, because there is no God, but we need a God. So it's just a projection of ourselves. And people say, well, that's that was really off the wall. But you see, he's cat. Feuerbach is catching cap capturing the, the reality of this. Now, scripture is just a reflection of ourselves. It's just a it's a projection of ourselves. And that's what we have now. 
because the Bible it does not stand above us, calling us to submit to it through the Spirit. It is now something that we control, we manipulate, and we shape according to our our, uh, our darkened understanding. And that's what we're that's what we're up against. I uh, I don't know if I'm going to have time for this, but you you can understand now. If, for those that know about Karl Barth, if you know about Karl Barth, Karl Barth did not believe that the Scripture was the Scripture until you had an encounter with God. You had to have an encounter with God because the scriptures were not the scripture until you had this encounter of God that he would give you the proper understanding of what the scripture says. I mean, that's in a nutshell about what it is. And you understand, you ask yourself, well, why would Karl Barth do that within the epoch of time in which he lived? And you'll, you'll have, I, I mean, I'm not going with Karl, although he's got 13 volumes. If you're going to change your theology, don't ever change your theology on a paperback book. If you're going to change your theology, change it on 13 volumes hardcover, all right? <laughs> that was a joke, everybody. Okay, 13 vibes, that's all that's that was Karl Barth's work. But listen, if you're living in Germany and they're actually and your fellow theologians are actually saying, your fellow theologians are actually saying that I find in the Bible that Hitler is there by God's providential care and he's there by God's appointment, he's God's man. What would you do to take the Bible away from that guy? He's actually using the sacred text of the German evangelical church to support this 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 monster. So if you say it's not God's word until you have this encounter with Christ or that you're in the spirit and you have this encounter with Jesus Christ and it's in this you it, it, the, uh, the scriptures are illuminated to you uh, that for me is a lot safer than turning the Bible over to somebody that is going to manipulate it so horribly and I'm, I'm not a Barthian because I mean in 13 vibes that's only a tidbit of what he, you know, he believes but what's happening here is once the Bible begun, begins to be, be owned by somebody they can do with it whatever they please and welcome to uh uh, our theological systems of 2023. He says, um, Kuiper asks, what good is this development as long as the study of God is abandoned to men? Men from their creation and rebellion against God have been incapable of knowing God. Well, if you're incapable of knowing God, then how can you have do anything positive with the scriptures? And then he says in his quote, as long as theology itself is abandoned to the rational subject, in which rational subject from the hour of his creation, no, no proper and separate principium, of knowing God has been allowed to assert itself. And here's where we are. I, I just find this, I mean, even as I say this, is very despondent. I mean, I don't want the Bible that I can manipulate. I want to have a Bible that comes from God that stands above me, right? It asserts itself, its authority over me, so I can hear the voice of God. Otherwise, I mean, uh, everybody just turns out, that goes back to home on Mansuro. Um, everybody just does that which is right in their own eyes. This is Kuiper's assessment of God's providence and allowing the historical critical method of which Warfield spoke of approvingly. It is a process where those governed by this darkened understanding of the natural man who considers the things of the spirit foolishness regard the scripture as his object to be investigated like animals and plants. So that all started on our shores with a great Presbyterian theologian called B.B. Warfield. Kuiper responds to it, but it's here now. And that we included that we, we included in volume three of our book because this answers the whole question here about providence. Yeah, we believe in providence. We believe it's all providential. People say, well, when he reinterprets the Westminster Confession, when Warfield reinterprets the Westminster Confession and says that it's uh, these men, these critics who don't even believe the Bible is God's word, is that not providential? Is that not providential? And you know what I say? It's absolutely providential. Absolutely. Because everything is providential. The fact that Hitler came to power is providential, right? All of this. God is in control of everything, the good and the bad. You have to just go one step further, which I probably by now is a broken record. You have to go one step further. Don't ever argue that it's not providential. I mean, it could be because it is. It's just God allowed it to happen in his providence. So we would be stronger by saying, no, we're not doing that. So much of what God does is there for us to reject it. Because we understand the scriptures, because the scriptures take precedent, precedence over how his, history unfolds, how providence manifests itself. So, all right. Well, that's uh, that's my hour, and I you can see that I uh, I think I use 
a third of the slides I put together. But um, any comments, questions? Hey, Dr. Van Cleek, I was just going to point. You'd like I was to just gonna... add anything yeah. there, Dr. Van Cleek? Yeah, can you hear me? Dr. Van Cleek, can you hear me? This All is right. Mark Brown. All right. Well, that was. I think, that I think was Mark that. was uh, trying the, to talk. That was the lion's share of uh, the Warfield stuff. Hello? But that is the that is the bridge. That is the bridge that we're living with today. So. Yeah, you, you, did you have something there? Becky? Anybody? A couple people had questions, I think. Are you not hearing them? I I cannot hear you. There's oh, hang on. Uh, no, that should be. See, this is we're having difficulty with the sound here tonight. I can't hear you. Um we might have to just forgo it because I cannot, for whatever reason. Yeah, and I can see my son is trying to get on too, and I cannot. Can you hear? Can you hear Peter? I'm not sure what it is. Hello. All right. I'm sorry, beloved. I cannot I cannot hear anybody tonight. I could not hear my son when we tried to get this set up. Let's let's do this. I get because I, I don't I, I haven't got it sorted out. Um if you could just remember whatever you want to say, all right. Uh we'll uh, we'll see if we can uh, if we could pick this up um, at a later date because I cannot hear anybody. Hang on. Yeah, I it should all be working, but I something got switched off. So, all right. Well, great to have everybody with us again tonight. So it's a it's a blessing to have you here, and um, we'll close with a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for the blessing of the evening. Thank you, Father, for your word, and we uh, we, we recount these things, but um, we just pray, Father, that as we know them, that we can be of good help to others, and uh, that you'll. We just need your help every day, Father. We need your help uh, as we speak to others and as we uh, deal with our own lives. Um, we just ask, Father, that you'll guide and direct us. And uh, and when we got this started, we just pray, Father, that there might be a breakthrough. It would be by thy design, and thy way. And uh, that we might see an institution or institutions and churches uh, see the uh, how egregious the, the decisions in the past have been, and perhaps these they weren't even thought through. It was just what they rolled into. But they'll begin to critically evaluate where they are and how they got there. And that by thy grace, Father, you might do a work of uh, awakening and revival in our midst. So, again, Father, I thank you for the beloved as they've gathered. Uh, give them a good night. Give us all a good night's rest. Prepare us for that which awaits us tomorrow. Thank you, Father, for your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.